Hi, welcome back. This is Professor Schimmel with part one of bacterial diseases of the respiratory system. Uh, you've got an outline that begins with upper respiratory system diseases and diphtheria is the first example. But before I get into a discussion of, of diphtheria and some other bacterial diseases, I wanted to uh, just make a couple of general statements about infections of this nature. First of all, Respiratory infections, specifically upper respiratory infections, are the most common type of infection. Just think about it. How many times in your life have you had a cold um, or the flu or bronchitis, right? Uh, so these are the most common types of uh, bacterial infections. And um, pathogens that cause respiratory diseases can in many cases cause diseases in other body sites. So um, in, in very serious cases, a respiratory infection might become systemic, right? And so other parts of the body might be affected. Uh, respiratory infections can be transmitted in some different ways. Uh, first of all would be inhalation of cough or sneeze produced droplets from an infectious, uh, uh, an infected individual. Secondly, direct contact. So let's say you, you shake hands with somebody that has a cold, um, they haven't washed their hands, ew, right? And then um, you don't think about it, you touch your eye or your nose, your mucous membranes, and you've become infected, all right? So direct contact. And fomites may also play a role in the transmission of these and, of course, other uh, infectious diseases. Uh, now, um, there is quite a bit of normal flora of the upper respiratory system. For example, uh, staphylococci, streptococci, um, Carini bacteria, um, Micrococcus, some species of bacillus, and others. As a matter of fact, some people have uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae, which happens to be a gram-negative organism, in low numbers in their upper respiratory system. So that organism and others can, under the uh, right circumstances, become opportunistic and cause disease. More on that later in this uh, chapter. Uh, now, there is no normal flora of the lower respiratory system. In a healthy individual, that will be sterile. So no flora of the lower respiratory system. All right, let's go ahead and talk about some examples of bacterial diseases of the upper respiratory system. I'm going to talk about uh, diphtheria, strep throat, even though it's not technically a respiratory infection, I'll talk about scarlet fever as well. Just looking to see what I'm going to cover in this, uh, this segment. Yeah, so that's what I'll cover. And then in part two, I will begin with uh, some bacterial diseases of the lower system. All right, so diphtheria. Uh, this is a disease caused by a bacterium named dip, uh, Carini bacterium diphtheriae, and it's gram-positive. Uh, and um, it is technically a bacillus, but it's rather pleomorphic. You, um, if you're looking at, um, let's say, a gram stain of Carini bacteria, uh, you would see some bacilli, but you would see some uh, some bent cells and maybe some that were club shaped, meaning um, thicker at one end than the other. So it is a rather pleomorphic bacterium, and that is characteristic of that organism. So that would be a hint if you were looking at a, um, a gram stain of this bacterium as to who it was that uh, you were viewing. Uh, now, this is a case where the bacterium has undergone lysogenic conversion, and I talked about this earlier this semester. This is a situation where Carini bacterium itself has become infected with a virus, and when that happens, uh, the virus is going to provide Carini bacterium with some genetic information that teaches the bacterium how to produce a toxin, and it's actually the toxin. Uh, that causes the symptoms of the disease diphtheria. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And once again, we call that lysogenic conversion. And that is in your, um, in your outline. All right, so um, talking about diphtheria, transmission, uh, typically through inhalation of cough-produced droplets, uh, possibly sneeze. And that could be from a symptomatic or an asymptomatic patient. Fomites are possible as well. Um, I wanted to mention before I talk in more detail about the respiratory form of this infection, and that is, is that some in some uh, tropical parts of the world, there is a cutaneous form of uh, disease caused by this bacterium. Uh, and that can be, uh, it, it, um, I didn't include, I don't think I did, now, I didn't include any photos of cutaneous uh, diphtheria, but there will be some pretty... Um, 
uh, significant skin lesions and there is a discharge from those and uh, that cutaneous diphtheria can be transmitted by coming into contact with those sores or that um, or that secretion. All right, so back to the respiratory form of the disease. Uh, and um, it's uh, going to have an incubation period of one to 10 days. I've got notes here, uh, two to five days is the average. And the symptoms will initially include a slight fever, the patient will be fatigued, experience malaise, uh, they will have a sore throat, and then um, their neck will become very swollen. There's a photo of it in your notes. It, it's um, only showing one side. This is typically bilateral, and they call it bull neck because the neck becomes so swollen that it pretty much goes straight down from the chin. Um, it's um, quite spectacular and really characteristic of the disease diphtheria. Uh, the patient will also develop over their um, soft palate and tonsils a thick um, whitish gray membrane called a pseudomembrane. Now, you see those two symptoms, the bull neck, the pseudomembrane, um, you can go ahead and safely make a presumptive diagnosis, and that's what your physician's going to do as well. All right, now, it's um, quite important that we do diagnose as soon as possible because that toxin is nothing to play around with. It is um, quite virulent, and if we don't treat the patient uh, within a few days, they could uh, potentially die from progressive, progressive organ failure caused by the effects of the toxin. All right, uh, diagnosis based upon the symptoms need to be quick. As far as treatment goes, uh, we will go ahead and give antibiotics. On my list, I've got on the top penicillin, then cephalosporin, uh, erythromycin, and depending on the age of our patient, um, uh, tetracycline um, may be uh, appropriate as well. Uh, but in addition to antibiotics, you know, I think I screwed that list up. So, um, and don't worry about the order, just some of the possible uh, antibiotics are penicillin, cephalosporin, uh, erythromycin, and tetracycline, depending on the age of the patient. So sorry about that, you guys. And we're also going to treat the patient with an antitoxin. And this is going to be, um, this can be produced in horses, pretty much the same technique that I discussed when I was talking about making snake bite anti-venom. Uh, and so that will help counteract the um, effects of that toxin. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to, um, and then I see there's a picture of the pseudomembrane and I already mentioned the uh, bull neck in your outline. Oh, as far as control goes, I did wonder to talk about that. How about rather than treat the patient with all of those things and let them, um, you know, be in this life-threatening situation. How about if we just prevent it, all right? Immunize the DPT vaccine. There are some new generation vaccines. DTaP coverage is about the same. That vaccine covers um, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis or whooping cough, which I talk about, I believe, in uh, part two. All right, so let's go ahead and immunize. All right, so let's get on and uh, talk about streptococcal pharyngitis, uh, and that is referring to strep throat. There are a couple of um, photos in your outline. That's a pretty nasty uh, photo of a, um, uh, an infected individual's throat, and then you can see the organism growing on a blood auger plate. Anyways, this disease is caused by streptococcus pyogenes, which is a gram-positive coccus, and it's referred to sometimes as group A, beta hemolytic strep. All right, beta hemolytic, you've got a photo showing beta hemolysis produced when strep pyogenes is grown on blood auger, and that, of course, refers to a total breakdown of the red blood cells, and so that bright, opaque blood auger will actually become transparent as those red blood cells are broken down. Uh, uh, so beta hemolytic, that's what that means, and then group A refers to a, um, uh, a set of very specific um, molecules that serve as markers on the surface of the cell and one of the things uh, that's significant about them is that we can use those to help us identify uh, the organism causing the infection. So group A beta hemolytic strep. This organism can also cause a common skin infection, common more in children called impetigo. It's um, usually it's seen like under the nose, around the mouth, can occur in other body sites and um, strep pyogenes can cause other soft tissue infections as well. 
Uh, but let's get into our discussion of strep throat. Transmission, typically inhalation of respiratory secretion, so cough or sneeze produce droplets. Incubation, two to five days. Um, and when the patient begins to express symptoms, they will include um, uh, inflammation of the mucous membranes of the throat, uh, a really irritated and sore throat, a fever, the lymph nodes of the neck are going to become swollen and tender, and otitis media, which means a middle ear infection, that is a common complication, and you'll see little kids get this kind of over and over. Uh, some miscellaneous facts. Okay, I think by now you guys know that I advocate using antibiotics only when necessary. And then when they are necessary, you take the darn things, right? You take them as prescribed, you take the whole course. Um, and this is a case where you really do need antibiotics because there are some serious potential complications, including scarlet fever and rheumatic fever um, that can occur in untreated cases. Uh, so uh, yeah, you need antibiotics for this one, you guys. And the drug of choice, oh, I'm sorry, I was on miscellaneous facts. Sorry, I'm getting out of order here. Let me look at your outline. Um, maybe um, put it just above diagnosis on your, out, your outline, you guys. But um, if you take antibiotics to treat this, you will only be contagious for, oh, maybe another 24 hours after beginning the course of antibiotics. If you don't treat this infection, you can be contagious for up to three weeks, right? Now, this can be a self-limiting infection, right? Strep throat, uh, but it's really one that I wouldn't gamble with. You have strep throat, you need to see your doctor uh, and take your antibiotics. Now, how do we diagnose this? Well, we can look in that patient's throat and make a fairly safe assumption that that patient has strep throat, but other ways that we can get a definitive answer. One is uh, the kind of the good old fashioned uh, traditional way is to uh, take a swab of the patient's throat, streak it on a blood auger plate, uh, incubate 24 hours. If you get results like the ones that I showed you in your outline, we've got a patient with strep throat. Uh, also, there are a number of manufacturers that make what they call um, instant tests for strep, similar uh, principle as the home pregnancy test that you can buy in the grocery store. But anyways, what the doctor will do is again, swab the throat, um, use this test kit that will have um, um, uh, antibodies uh, uh, against the, um, the bacterial antigen and uh, process it. And it can take as short as maybe 15 minutes to as long as maybe an hour or so and get definitive uh, results and uh, be absolutely sure as to the diagnosis. Uh, and most doctor's offices and hospitals have one or more varieties of those instant strep tests available. Treatment, penicillin is still the drug of choice. Uh, erythromycin is a good choice too if the patient isn't tolerant or if um, susceptibility testing's been done and penicillin is not our best choice. Uh, tetracycline, not a good choice. Uh, the blackening of teeth in young people aside, a number of strains of strep pyogenes have developed resistance to tetracycline. So tetracycline is not a good, uh, not a good choice. And I have a note here, there are over 55 serologic strains of strep pyogenes. That's a lot of them. All right. And um, we need to control this disease through treatment when appropriate. Now, I wanna talk next about scarlet fever, which as I mentioned earlier, isn't technically a respiratory disease, but it can be a complication or it can occur. You can just sort of launch right into scarlet fever and skip the strep throat part, but um, it can be a complication of strep throat. So caused by the same organism, the gram-positive uh, strep pyogenes, but there are strains of strep pyogenes that have been viral infected and so they've undergone that lysogenic conversion, and these um, strep strains produce what's called an urethogenic toxin, and I think that's in your notes. Yeah, it is. Okay, and that means red causing toxin. All right, scarlet fever, this is making sense, right? Uh, transmission, same as strep, and as I mentioned earlier, it can be a, a complication of progression of strep throat, or you can skip the strep throat part. Uh, incubation is the same, um, average two to five days. Now, symptoms, um, we may have had the earlier strep 
throat symptoms, but with scarlet fever, we're going to see a red skin rash and you've got some photos in your outline that you might want to take a look at. Um, a red skin rash and um, it can occur anywhere in the body and it will undergo a deep peel about 10 days in. The patient will have a high fever, uh, their tongue will become spotted and swollen, and deafness, not just a middle ear infection, but deafness is a possible complication. Um, and as far as treatment goes, penicillin is the drug of choice. So don't mess around with strep, get it treated. Okay, that wraps up uh, my coverage of bacterial diseases of the upper respiratory system, and I will see you soon. Have a good day.